Hello and welcome to our second live Tell Me More About session. For the next 20 minutes, we will dive deeper into the topic of bioprinting as we try to find out as much as we can about printing bone tissue with Professor Risto Contio. And remember, this is Channel One, we are still live, so make sure you make the most of this session by submitting any question you might have right down below. Risto Contio is now joining us live from Finland. Risto, good evening. Thank you for being with us. Where exactly are you tonight? <laughs> Good evening, good evening. I'm here in, at my home in Corvo, beautiful city, just on the seashore. My home is about 40 kilometers from my work, Helsinki University Hospital. Yes. And, and it's, it's almost, almost night here in Finland at the moment. Yeah, we have an hour time difference, so we are very glad you're still exactly. able to join us tonight, live via this live connection. You are a professor at the University of Helsinki and a specialist in maxo maxillofacial surgery. Love that word. Right. And uh, one hour ago, we learned from Professor Bilal al Nawaz about the enormous potential of bioprinting. Can you share with us what it is that really excites you about printing bone tissue? Yeah, thank you, Garrett. Yeah, that is a very good question. I've been wondering that too, <laughs> but seriously. Um, Reconstruction of the large bone defect in facial skeleton, especially after tumor ablative surgery, is a major challenge. To overcome that challenge, we have in Helsinki developed a major, uh, would, uh, developed years 3D CAD CAM technique uh, with uh, patient specific manufacturing. So, bone printing is a natural extension of that image. So let me show you and share my image for a, for a moment. So here first, you see my beautiful city here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but now the really what I wanted to show you is that the great benefit of CAD CAM technique is that the exact copy of the patient's anatomy. Here you can see that in the row two in virtual 3D reality can be digitally manipulated, including simulation, surgical planning and implant design. Then the printer fabricates precise and identical solid, solid model. So in theory, this patient specific model has both micro and macro structure similar to original host tissue. So we understood that integration of 3D CAD CAM and tissue engineering is the key for successful bioprinting. Exactly. So now that we have the opportunity to create these 3D models, um, let's, let's find out. We are speaking to each other in October 2020, and I should say that for everyone watching this in recording. Are you able to give us a brief overview of the state of research in the area of bone tissue printing? That is really a wide area, but I try to be really a short. Uh, first of all, to give an audience a picture of the use of cat cap in clinical settings, so I will share my image again, uh, my slides to show you what really, uh, what is really going on there on the field. So here you can see that most of the, uh, of the CAD CAM technology are focused on surgical guides, models for surgery planning, custom implants and so on. And, and the bioprinting itself, that's really a minor research, which is at the moment related to, to computerized modeling and bioprinting. But related to bone tissue engineering and bioprinting, two main lines exist. And that's good to understand and know. First, printing cells and biomaterials simultaneously. That is the first line. The second line is 3D scaffold printer printed first and then seeded with cells and other bioactive materials. So printing together cells and biomaterial and printing separately the scaffold and biomaterial. 
So here is a busy slide, but here you can see that so many different study lines are uh, available and so many study lines where the research at the moment is going on related to CAD CAM and tissue engineering. Translational studies, so experimental studies have shown that new bone can be obtained using tissue engineering technology and CAD CAM. Bone growth in mandible, most of these studies are on mandible or calvarian bone. And, and bone growth can be uh, uh, executed and, 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 and uh, 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 using stem cells and polylactic, polyglucolic polymer scaffolds. And they have shown to, to uh, bring bone to the, to the defect area. Grayson and co-workers manufactured manipulable condal scaffold using CAD technique perfusion react reactor with human mesenchymal stem cells. Viable bone was detected and complex geometry of the neocondyl was obtained. Gioca reconstructed again manipulable condyl using hydroxyapatite scaffold manufactured by CAD CAM technique in sheep model. So let me show you the study we've just finishing in Helsinki. In mini pig model here in this slide, polytrimethylene carbonate uh, with 35% uh, weight percent of beta tricalcium phosphate composite manufactured by stereolithography was implanted to repair multiple defect. After the follow-up, new bone, as you can see here in the right-hand side image, right-hand side images, you can see new bone growth in that area. But uh, the study showed also, and the result is that also in the control animals, the bone growth was detected so not so clear result, but promising. And this, in a way, also describes the uh, translational and uh, clinical studies. So there are not really a solid evidence of, of, of bone growth and acceleration of bone growth using tissue engineering technology. Have to keep in mind that the neovascularization, and I'll, I'll take this again. Can I, okay. So, uh, neovascularization and nutrition of cells is a key in bone regeneration. And that is what, what I would say is a very promising and very um, important uh, line of study. Work and co-workers used a central vascular pedicle placed through 3D printed uh, tricalcium phosphate cylinders uh, seeded with bone marrow. Results of that study line are promising and, and that is something we will come up later again that nutrition and neovascularization is a key. At the end of the day, only scattered clinical studies of bioprinting facial skeleton are available. Major studies are just case reports and related to separate scaffold printing and then seeded with cells, particulate bone and or other bioactive materials. Zetola and co-workers reconstructed clinically mandible defect using recombinant human bone morphogenetic protein 2 associated with collagen, sponge and combination of autogenous bone chips, cortical bone and beta tricalcium uh, phosphate blocks. The largest study I know 
of the use of autolytrous stem cells in cranial maxillofacial bone reconstruction is published by Sanders and co-workers, coincidentally from Finland. Study group used 3D technique and tissue engineering to repair mandible block defect. Patient-specific implants were filled with beta tricalcium phosphate and autologous cancellar on bone chips with uh, recombinant human bone for morphogenetic protein too. Out of 13 study cases, 10 were successful. So let me share you again a few slides. Let me see how can I do that. Well, at the moment, we are still looking at your slides, Risto. All the time we've been looking at the Kramax ah. study from Helsinki. So that's where your but slides currently are. Yeah, they are now. Let me, OK, if they are still there. So I thought that it's my face, which was. But no, no. We, okay. we, so we were carefully next... listening and taking notes of all the studies you presented. Thank you. Good, but good. Please continue. OK, so no problem. No problem. So this is a set, set up how these we do in Finland. So we used a titanium scaffold and we have published 14 of, of cases of this kind of, uh, of reconstruction. So titanium scaffold, which is filled with the tricalcium phosphate, free bone grafts and bone morphogenetic too. And here is one of the patients and that is a maxillary defect. CAD CAM and tissue engineering reconstruction after total maxillectomy. So here you can see, and I share the preoperative images. And CAD CAM, uh, 3D printed polylactyl scaffolds were inserted uh, to lateral thigh, as you can see here in the left hand side, upper image. Uh, Flap was raised after nine months and implanted into the maxillary defect. Here on the right or left hand side left, you can see the, the ectopic or nail bone, which is twisted uh, by the means of, of the titanium reconstruction plate. And that is then uh, implanted into into maxillary defect and, and, and dental implants were placed, as you can see, and prosthesis produced. And the next slide shows you, hopefully, the neomaxilla, the ectopic bone, where you can see blood circulation. Yes. So now I try to take out of the slides so that you can see me. Let me see how can I do it. Yes, Mr. Well, you do it. Let me thank you for this extensive overview that you have prepared. What we see yeah. is that a lot of people are doing clinical test experiments, but there's also still a lot of work to be done. Well, Risto, you and I also have some work to be done because I see there's a lot of questions coming in from our viewers joining us live. Is it okay if I ask you a few? Yeah. All right, let me start with this question from Pedro in Madrid. Welcome, Pedro. Buenas noches. He says, can mature bone be printed right away or should it go to a cartilage phase first? Yeah, it can be printed right away. No cartilage phase is needed. There, depending on the technique, you have to remember that, that it is a network, network of feedback signals from, from all the molecules and all the cytokines you have, and also mechanical stimulus and mechanical stress has an impact. So, Risto, question... Risto, let me quickly interrupt you. We noticed that you have turned off the camera. So instead of turning off the slides, we lost your face and we would love to see you as you would like yourself. So before you finish your an answer, could you make sure you switch back on the camera in our Zoom call? Bottom left, I think, for you. Um, and then uh, please finish that answer about uh, ready. I hope to see you behind me back on the screen once that is working. Uh, stop share now. 
Good. Yeah, stop, share, and turn on the camera. Yes, we see you now. Thank you. Thank good, you. good. <laughs> yeah, this is also, also many times now, this is uh, really our everyday life, these, uh, these uh, distant meetings, but, you exactly. know, exactly. these techniques are at the late of the reading. So, yeah, so repeating to just a short repeat, so it's complicated, but you are able to produce bone directly for, 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 uh, for, from, from cells and, and scaffold construct. So it doesn't need to go through cartilage space. Exactly, exactly. So, thanks. Let me quickly pitch a few more questions to you, see if we can answer as many as we can. I have an, uh, a question from Hubert, I think it's French, because he's from Limoges, and he says, how to make sure that a grafted, reconstructed bone will osseointegrate in the surrounding native bone? Do you have any tips for that? Uh, it is a very, that is a very good question. And, and uh, the, it's, it's uh, related to blood circulation and related, of course, of the stability of the structure. If you implant in situ, if you implant the, the scaffold with the cells and, and other bio, bio material in, 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 in the bone defect directly, so you need to have a very stable structure and you need to cover it very carefully so that there will be no fistulas. And, and it's the, it's the uh, living environment which then uh, supports the, the integration of the, the, the neobone and, and the original mandible or maxilla. So you need to cover it well and you need to have a stable fixation. Exactly, so that's very clear advice. Let me quickly throw another one at you, slightly related. Maria is with us from Parma, and she says, could we make a bi bioprinted bone less resortive than an autograft? That's always an issue when we do bone augmentation. What, what do you know about that? Oh, oh, oh uh, ask me once more, I didn't get the, the Can, can question. we do something to make the bioprinted bone that we introduce less resortive than, a, uh, than an autograft? Uh, autocraft itself, if you have a craft autocraft, so it, it is real, it, it resorbs a lot R already, uh, the autocraft itself, it, it resorbs from 50, from 70 to 50 percent. The, the key is the vascularization. If you are able to, to produce a very rapid uh, uh, neovascularization through the, the uh, the ectopic bone or the scaffold and cells, so the resorption rate is low. But of course, if the if the vascularization, it, if it takes time, so that is in fact one of the key issues here that you are able to produce a a quick and prompt neovascularization. Otherwise, the risk of resorption is high. Exactly. Now, final question. Just give me a yes or a no, Risto. I like this question from John joining us from London Live. Can we expect a tooth ever to be bioprinted? And is that then the end of implantology? Yes or no, Risto? Yes. Yes, you think we will be printing the next, tooth? In the next 10 years. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much, uh, Risto Contio, live with us from Finland. Thank you for providing this extensive overview of where we are on the topic of bone tissue printing. Um, Thank you for your very active participation. I don't think I think this is a new record. This is the most ever audience questions we had on a Tell Me More About session, and that's what it's all about. And we are aware that some of you submitted questions that didn't get picked up. So that's why right now on our channel eight, the Tell Me More About After Discussions chat, you can join there. Risto Contio will also join there, and probably all the other participants might chat along as well. You can continue the conversation about printing bio tissue, uh, bone tissue.